prophecy fulfilled a historian's account of the last siege of Jerusalem in 70 AD <clears throat> The early Christian under, understanding was that the Jewish people were being punished for the rejection of Christ may seem very harsh today. But we must understand that this was a widespread view for many hundreds of years. Only now, in an age of political correctness, liberal views, and a concern for human rights, has it become unfashionable to express such a view. Yet let there be no doubt that when the people of Judea demanded that Barabbas, the robber, should be released and that Jesus should be condemned, those people apparently accepted a curse upon themselves and upon their children for the rejection of Jesus. Scripture itself states, Matthew 27, 25, Then all the people answered and said, Let his blood be on us and on our children. Folks, I'm going to read you a couple of quotes from some commentators in the... Uh, early uh, 19th century um, to late 19th century. We're going to see what they had to say regarding this situation. And then I'm going to read you a few chapters from church history from one of the early church historians or early church writers, Eusebius, uh, who basically used the accounts of Josephus to describe what happened around 70 AD events and signs and warnings that happened prior to 70 AD to give the the, the Christians time enough to escape and flee and we're gonna see with that massive study we did on Matthew 24 the fulfillment of this and how and today, this is not, I mean, yeah, granted, people mentioned, oh, the siege of Jerusalem, 70 AD, this happened, but that's all they, they won't, they don't want to dive into the history of this. Because they know it would hurt a lot of their dispensational theologies out there regarding, oh, the final seven years of the 70 AD it ha it has to, has, still has to be fulfilled because that's only a prophecy for the Jews. So the Jews still have seven years left after the church is raptured <laughs> you know to get it right okay folks this this was not the thought of the early church okay and we're gonna see this even in as late as the 19th century so let's go ahead and read some of these commentaries <sighs> um Bible commentator B.W. Johnston from 1833 to 1894 stated, Matthew 24, 21, quote, Great Tribulation. The account given by Josephus, a Jewish historian who witnessed and re recorded the war, is almost an echo of the predictions of Christ. Women ate their own children from starvation. The Jews whom the city fought each other as well as the Roman army on August 10, A.D. 70, the city was stormed and there was a universal massacre. 1,100,000 persons perished, and 100,000 survivors were sold into slavery. Lutheran theologian Philip Schaff, 1819-1893, wrote, quote, The forbearance of God with his covenant people who had crucified their own Savior reached at reached it last its limit. As many as could be saved in the usual way were rescued. The mass of the people had obstinately set themselves against all improvement. James the Just, the man who was fitted, if any could be, to reconcile the Jews to the Christian religion, had been stoned by its hardened brethren, for whom he daily interceded in the, in the temple, and with him the Christian community in Jerusalem had lost its importance for that city. The hour of the great tribulation and fearful judgment drew near. The prophecy of the Lord approached its literal fulfillment. Jerusalem was razed to the ground, the temple burned, and not one stone was left left upon another. That's History of the Christian Church by Philip Schaff, page 397 and 398. Charles Spurgeon, 1834 to 1892, wrote, For there shall be great tribulations, tribulations such as was not since the beginning of the world to this time, no, nor ever shall be. 
Read the record written by Josephus of the destruction of Jerusalem and see how truly our Lord's words were fulfilled. The Jews impiously said concerning the death of Christ, his blood, be, his blood be on us and on our children. Never did any other people invoke such an awful curse upon themselves, and upon no other nation did such a judgment over, ever, 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 ever fall. We read, the Jews crucified till there was no more wood for making crosses. Of thousands of the people staying one another in their fierce faction fights within the city, of so many of them being sold for slaves, that they became a drug in the market, and all but valueless, and of the fearful carnage when the Romans at length entered the doomed capital, and the blood-curdling story exactly bears out the Savior's statements uttered nearly forty years before the terrible events occurred. The destruction of Jerusalem was more terrible than anything that the world has ever witnessed, either before or since. Even Titus seemed to see in his cruel work the hand of an avenging God. That was commentary on Matthew by Charles Spurgeon, Prince of Pre Preachers, by the way, page 412 and 413. Bishop William Newcomb, in, in his Harmony of the Gospels, 1778, wrote, The calamities undergone by the Jews were unparalleled in their history and will remain so. The many and great evils arising from their own destructions, distractions and intestine madness were peculiar to this time, and Josephus asserts, in general, that no other city underwent such sufferings. In particular, he says that the number of captives throughout the whole war was 97,000, and that 1,100,000 perished in the course of the siege. To these must be added 237,490 of whom express mention is due by this historian, as being destroyed in other places besides innumerable others, not subject to calculation, who were swept away by fatigue, famine, disease, and every kind of wretchedness and violence. Thus did the awakened vengeance of heaven require of that generation the blood of all the prophets which had been shed from the foundation of the world. In our own day, Gary DeMar has, co has commented, quote, the tribulation period cannot be global because all one has to do to escape is flee to the mountains. Notice that Jesus says, let those who are in Judea flee to the mountains, Matthew 24, 16. Judea is not the world, it's not even the nation of Israel. Last Day's Madness, page 121. So we may observe that probably the great majority of the evangelical scholars of the church over many centuries, but especially in the early centuries, saw AD 70 as being momentous in terms of prophecy and eschatology. Three general points were usually accepted during the early church. One, the Jewish nation incurred the ongoing wrath of God for the rejection of the Messiah. Notice the word ongoing. To complete destruction of the Jewish temple system underlined that the temple period was exhausted and complete and would not be restored in that form. From this point, only the preaching of the gospel of Jesus had God's authority. And number three, the events of A.D. 70 plainly fulfilled at least a substantial part of the Mount Olivet prophecy. Matthew 24, Mark 13, and Luke 21. So again, I'm not bringing this video to <laughs> offend anybody, even though it's going to offend some. And... The thing is, is I'm laying everything on the table here. Now, this whole series, and and it's, I mean, it has gotten criticism from some from some people out there already. But folks, it's only going to get worse because what the things that I'm going to be going into that is believed today is going to totally shake and rattle your core. And I don't care. If people come on me, you know, come at me and say, "Oh, that's hate speech. Oh, that's anti-Semitism." You know what? It, you know, I, I, I really don't care what your definition of anti-Semitism is. Okay, the whole thing with anti-Semitism is to subject one group of people, separate them from everybody else, when really the term Semitism is comprised of all people of Middle Eastern accent. 
okay? It's not just one particular group of people. So if you're going to claim anti-Semitism for me spouting off quotes and historical facts, so be it. I really don't care. Okay? So I'm just going to warn you right now that the stuff that I'm going to be getting into from here on out, you know, it's, it's not going to be pretty. And I ain't going to... I ain't gonna feed you cookies and cream. Okay? So, let's go ahead. I'm gonna read from Eusebius' uh, Church History, um, Book 3, starting in chapter 5. I'll post the links be below so you can read this yourself. And, uh, you know, you come to your own conclusions. Eusebius basically takes into account the records of Josephus of what happened and the miracles and signs and wonders that preceded this event that warned these Christians to flee into the mountains into a place called Pella. Where there the spreading of the gospel would continue. And obviously those people that fled Jerusalem were in and of themselves Jews. And these Jews basically took upon themselves to spread the gospel into the entire world. So we have a lot of, I mean we, you know, it's quite prophetically factual. That is the Jews who brought us the gospel. Okay, and I'm not taking that away from them at all. Alright? But, let history and facts speak. That's all I gotta say. Chapter 5, The Last Siege of the Jews After Christ. After Nero had held the power 13 years, and Galba and Otho had ruled a year and six months, Vespasian, who had became... Distinguished in the campaigns against the Jews was proclaimed sovereign in Judea and received the title of emperor from the armies there. Setting out immediately, therefore, for Rome, he entrusted the conduct of the war against the Jews to his son Titus. For the Jews, after the ascension of our Savior, in addition to the, their crime against him, had been devising as many plots as they could against his apostles. First Stephen was stoned to death by them, and after him James, the son of Zebedee, and the brother of John, was beheaded. And finally James, the first that had obtained the episcopal seat in Jerusalem after the ascension of our Savior, died in the manner already described. But the rest of the apostles who had been incessantly plotted against with a view to their destruction and had been driven out of the land of Judea, went unto all nations to preach the gospel, relying upon the power of Christ, who had said to them, Go and make disciples of all the nations in my name. But the people of the church in Jerusalem had been commanded by a revelation vouchsafed to, to approved men there before the war to leave the city and to dwell in a certain town of Perea called Pella. And when those that believed in Christ had come there from Jerusalem, then, as if the royal city of the Jews and the whole land of Judea were entirely destitute of holy men, the judgment of God at length overtook those who had committed such outrages against Christ and his apostles and totally destroyed that generation of impious men. Fulfilling Matthew 23 and Matthew 24 regarding that generation. But the number of calamities which everywhere fell upon the nation at that time, the extreme misfortunes to which the inhabitants of Judea were especially subjected, the thousands of men, as well as women and children that perished by the sword, by famine, and by other forms of death innumerable, all these things, as well as the many great sieges which were carried on against the cities of Judea, and the excessive sufferings endured by those that fled to Jerusalem itself as to a city of perfect safety, and finally the general course of the whole war, as well as its particular occurrences in detail, and how at last the abomination of desolation proclaimed by the prophets Daniel 9.27 stood in the very temple of God, 
so celebrated of old the temple, which was now awaiting its total and final destruction by fire, all these sayings any one that wishes may find accurately described in the history written by Josephus. But it is necessary to state that this writer records that the multitudes of those who were assembled from all Judea at that time of the Passover to the number of three million souls were shut up in Jerusalem as in a prison, to use his own words. For it was right that in the very days in which they had inflicted suffering upon the Savior and the benefactor of all, the Christ of God, that in those days, shut up as in a prison, they should meet with destruction at the hands of divine justice. But passing by the particular calamities which they suffered from the attempts made upon them by the sword and by other means, I think it necessary to relate only the misfortunes which the famine caused, that those who read this work may have some means of knowing that God was not long in executing vengeance upon them for their wickedness against the Christ of God. Chapter 6, The Famine Which Oppressed Them. This is where it's going to get a little bit gruesome in detail, okay? But I am not going to hold anything back. I'm going to read this word for word. And you take what you want to take out of it. Chapter 6, The Famine Which Oppressed Them. Again, this is from early church writer Eusebius. Who lived around the time of the 4th century, 300 AD or so. <clears throat> Taking the fifth book of the history of Josephus again in our hands, let's go through the tragedy of events which then occurred. For the wealthy, he says, Josephus, it was equally dangerous to remain, for under pretense that they were going to, to desert, Men were put to death for their wealth. The madness of the seditions increased with the famine, and both the miseries were inflamed more and more day by day. Nowhere was food to be seen, but bursting into the house as men searched them thoroughly. And whenever they found anything to eat, they tormented the owners on the ground that they had denied that they had anything. But if they found nothing, they tortured them on the ground that they had more carefully concealed it. The proof of their having or not having food was found in the bodies of the poor wretches. Those of them who were still in good condition, they assumed, were well supplied with food, while those who were already wasted away, they passed by. For it seemed absurd to slay those who were on the point of perishing for want. Many indeed secretly sold their possessions for one measure of wheat. If they belonged to the wealthier class of barley, if they were poor, then shutting themselves up in the innermost parts of their houses, some, some ate the grain uncooked on account of their terrible want while others baked it according as necessity and fear dictated. Nowhere were tables set, but snatching the yet uncooked food from the fire, they tore it in pieces. Wretched was the fare, and a lamentable spectacle it was to see the more powerful secure in abundance while the weaker mourned. Of all evils, indeed, famine is the worst. And this was, and I'm going to interject here, and this was part and partial what went on during the last three or four years of this siege of Jerusalem. Okay, and in the next chapter I'm going to read to you, you're going to see the warnings that were given, according to historical accounts, from Josephus, from these early writers. And again, you draw your own conclusions. Of all evils, continuing on, indeed, famine is the worst, and it destroys nothing so effectively as shame. For that which under other circumstances is worthy of respect, and the midst of famine is despised. Thus women snatch the food from the very mouths of their husbands and children, from their fathers, and what was most pitiable of all, mothers from their babies. And while their dearest ones were wasting away in their arms, they were not ashamed to take away from them the last drops that supported life. And even while they were eating thus, they did not remain undiscovered, but everywhere the rioters appeared to rob them, even of these portions of food. For whenever they saw a house shut up, they regarded it as a sign that those inside were taking food. And immediately bursting open the doors, they rushed in and seized what they were eating, almost forcing it out of their very throats. Old men who clung to their food were beaten, and if the women concealed it in their hands, their hair was torn for so doing. There was, pit, there was pity neither for gray hairs nor for infants, but taking up the babes, 
that clung to their morsels of food. They dashed them to the ground. But to those that anticipated their entrance and swallowed what they were about to seize, they were still more cruel, just as if they had been wronged by them. And they devised the most terrible modes of torture to discover food, stopping up the privy passages of the poor wretches with bitter herbs and piercing their seats with sharp rods. And men suffered things horrible even to hear of for the sake of compelling them to, con to confess to the possession of any, of, of any one loaf of bread, or in order that they might be made to disclose a single drachm of barley which they had concealed. But the tormentors themselves did not suffer hunger. <clears throat> their conduct might indeed have seemed less barbarous if they had been driven to it by necessity, but they did it for the sake of exercising their madness and of providing sustenance for themselves for days to come. And when one crept out of the city by night, as far as the outposts of the Romans to collect wild herbs and grass, they went to meet him, and when he thought he had already escaped the enemy, they seized what he had brought with them, and even though oftentimes a man would entreat them, and calling upon the most awful name of God adjure them to give him a portion of what he had obtained at the risk of his life. They would give him nothing back. Indeed, it was fortunate if the one that was plundered was not also slain. <clears throat> to this account, Josephus, after relating other things, adds the following. The possibility of going out of the city being brought to an end, all hope of safety for the Jews was cut off. And the famine increased, and devoured the people by houses and families. And the rooms were filled with dead women and children. The lanes of the city with the corpses of old men. Where were the miraculous miracles protecting the Jewish people then? And they rejected the Messiah then, and they reject the Messiah today. So what, all of a sudden God has some change of heart? Children and youths, swollen with the famine, wandered about the marketplaces like shadows and fell down wherever the death agony overtook them. The sick were not strong enough to bury even their own relatives, and those who had the strength hesitated because of the multitude of the dead and the uncertainty as to their own fate. Many indeed died while they were burying others, and many betook themselves to their graves before death came upon them. There was neither weeping nor lamentation under these misfortunes, but the famine stifled the natural affections. Those that were dying a lingering death looked with dry eyes upon those that had gone to their rest before them. Deep silence and death-laden night encircled the city of Jerusalem. But the robbers were more terrible than these miseries, for they broke open the houses which were now mere sepulchres, robbed the dead and stripped the covering from their bodies, and went away with a laugh. They tried the points of their swords in the dead bodies, and some that were lying on the ground still alive, they thrust through in order to test their weapons. But those that prayed that they would use their right hand and their sword upon them, they contemptuously left to be destroyed by the famine. Every one of these died with eyes fixed upon the temple, and they left the seditious alive. These at first gave orders that the dead should be buried out of the public treasury, for they could not endure the stench. But afterward, when they were not able to do this, they threw the bodies from the walls into the trenches. And as Titus went around and saw the trenches filled with the dead, and the thick blood oozing out of the putrid bodies, he groaned aloud and, raising his hands, called God to witness that this was not his doing. After speaking of some other things, Josephus proceeds as follows. I cannot hesitate to declare what my feelings compel me to. I suppose if the Romans had longer delayed in coming against these guilty wretches, the city would have been swallowed up by a chasm, or overwhelmed with a flood, or struck with such thunderbolts as destroyed Sodom, for it had brought forth a generation of men much more godless than were those that suffered such punishment. By their madness, indeed, was the whole people brought to destruction." And in the sixth book of Josephus, he writes as follows. Of those that perished by famine in the city, the number was countless, and the miseries they underwent unspeakable. For if so much as the shadow of food appeared in any houses, there was war, 
and the dearest friends engage in hand-to-hand -hand conflict with one another and snatch from each other the most wretched supports of life. Nor would they believe that even the dying were without food, but the robbers would search them while they were expiring, lest any one should feign death while concealing food in his bosom, with mouths gaping for want of food. They stumbled and staggered along like mad dogs and beat the doors as if they were drunk, and in their impotence they would rush into the same houses twice or thrice in one hour. Necessity compelled them to eat anything they could find, and they gathered and devoured things that were not fit even for the filthiest of irrational beasts. Finally, they did not abstain even from their girdles and shoes, and they stripped the hides off their shields and devoured them. Some used even wisps of old hay for food, and others gathered stubble and sold the smallest weight of it for four attic drachmae. But why should I speak of the shamelessness which was displayed during the famine toward inanimate things? For I am going to relate a fact such as recorded neither by Greeks nor barbarians, horrible to relate, incredible to hear, and indeed I should gladly have omitted this calamity that I might not seem to posterity to be a teller of fabulous tales, if I had not innumerable witnesses to it in my own age, and besides I should render my country poor service if I suppressed the account of the sufferings which she endured. There was a certain woman named Mary that dwelt beyond Jordan, whose father was Eliezer, of the village of Bethazer, which signifies the house of Hyssop. She was distinguished for her family and her wealth, and had fled with the rest of the multitude to Jerusalem and was shut up there with them during the siege. The tyrants had robbed her of the rest of the property, which she had brought with her into the city of Perea. And the remnants of her possessions and whatever food was to be seen, the guards rushed in daily and snatched away from her. This made the woman terribly angry, and by her frequent reproaches and imprecations, she arose the anger of the rapacious villains against herself. But well, no one either through anger or pity would slay her, and she grew weary of finding food for others to eat. The search, too, was already become everywhere difficult and the famine was piercing her bowels and marrow, and resentment was raging more violently than famine. Taking therefore anger and necessity as her counselor, she proceeded to do a most unnatural thing. <sighs> Seizing her child, a boy which was sucking at her breast, she said, O oh, wretched child in war, in famine, in sedition, for what do I preserve you? Slaves among the Romans we shall be even if we are allowed to live by them, but even slavery is anticipated by the famine, and the rioters are more cruel than both. Come, be food for me, a fury for these rioters, and a byword to the world, for this is all that is wanting to complete the calamities of the Jews. And when she, and when she had said this, she slew her son, and having roasted him, she ate one half herself, and covered up the remainder, she kept it. Very soon, the rioters appeared on the scene, and smelling the nefarious odor, they threatened to slay her immediately unless she would show them what she had prepared. She replied that she had saved an excellent portion for them, and with that she uncovered the remains of the child. They were immediately seized with horror and amazement and stood transfixed at the sight. But she said, This is my own son, and the deed is mine. Eat, for I too have eaten. Be more merciful than a woman nor more compassionate than a mother. But if you are too pious and shrink from my sacrifice, I have already eaten of it. Let the rest also remain for me. At these words the men went out trembling, and this one case being affrighted yet with difficulty, did they yield that food to the mother. Forthwith the whole city was filled with the awful crime, and as all pictured the terrible deed before their own eyes, they trembled as if they had done it themselves. Those that were suffering from the famine now longed for death, and blessed were they that had died before hearing and seeing miseries like these. Such was the reward which the Jews received for their wickedness and impiety against the Christ of God. <coughs> okay. So now we're going to go in chapter 7. And we're going to look at the predictions of Christ regarding the siege of Jerusalem before we close this portion of the series. Um, it's called The Predictions of Christ, again, by the same author, Eusebius. 
and we're going to see the warnings that these people have had given before they fled because obviously you know God doesn't do anything without warning first and so you're going to see what happened in regarding certain visions and signs and wonders and these types of things so let's go ahead and read this final portion before I close this video out chapter 7 the predictions of Christ it is fitting to add to these accounts a true prediction of our Savior in which he foretold these very events his words are as follows woe unto them that are with child and to them that give suck in those days but pray that your flight be not in the winter, neither on the Sabbath day, for there shall be great tribulation, such as was not since the beginning of the world. To this time, no nor ever shall be. The historian, reckoning the whole number of the slain, says that 1,100,000, 1 or 1.1 million, persons perished by famine and sword, and that the rest of the rioters and robbers being betrayed by each other after the taking of the city were slain, but the tallest of the youths and those that were distinguished for beauty were preserved for the triumph. Of the rest of the multitude, those that were over, over 17 years of age were sent as prisoners to labor in the works of Egypt, while still more were scattered through the provinces to meet their death in the theaters by the sword and by beasts. Those under 17 years of age were carried away to be sold as slaves, and of these alone the number reached 90,000. These things took place in this manner in the second year of the reign of Vespasian, in accordance with the prophecies of our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ, who by div divine power saw them beforehand, as if they were already present, and wept and mourned according to the statement of the holy evangelists, who give the very words which he uttered, when, as if addressing Jerusalem herself, he said, If you had known even you in this day the things which belong unto your peace, but now they are hid from your eyes. For the day shall come upon you that your enemy shall cast a rampart about you, and compass you around, and keep you in on every side, and shall lay you and your children even with the ground. These were uh, evangelists around that time that were living in Jerusalem prior to the siege that were giving warnings like these. But they were basically construed as false prophets much like we have today and then as of speaking concerning the people he says for there shall be great distress in the land and wrath upon this people and they shall fall by the edge of the sword and shall be led away captive into all nations and Jerusalem shall be trodden down of the Gentiles until the times of the Gentiles be fulfilled and again when you, when you shall see Jerusalem compassed with armies and know that the desolation thereof is near if anyone compares the words of our Savior with the other accounts of the historian concerning the whole war, how can one fail to wonder and to admit that the foreknowledge and the prophecy of our Savior were truly divine and marvelously strange? Concerning those calamities, then, that befell the whole Jewish nation after the Savior's passion, and after the words which the multitudes of the Jews uttered, when they begged the release of the robber and murderer, but besought that the prince of life should be taken from their midst, it is not necessary to add anything to the account of the historian. But it may be proper to mention also those events which exhibited the graciousness of that all-good providence which held back their destruction for 40, full forty years after their crime against Christ, during which time many of the apostles and disciples and James himself, the first bishop there in Jerusalem, the one who is called the brother of the Lord were still alive and dwelling in Jerusalem itself remain the surest bulwark of the place divine providence thus still proved itself long-suffering toward them in order to see whether by re repentance for what they had done they might obtain pardon and salvation and in addition for such long-suffering providence also furnished wonderful signs of the things which were about to happen to them if they did not repent Since these matters have been thought worthy of mention by the historian already cited, we cannot do better than to recount them for the benefit of the reader of this work. The signs which preceded the war. Now, why don't you pay close attention to these signs that, jo that Josephus and uh, Eusebius makes mention here. Because these are very interesting. Ten. 
taking then the work of this author read what he records in the sixth book of his history his words are as follows thus were the miserable people won over at this time by the impostors and false prophets but they did not heed nor give credit to the visions and signs that foretold the approaching desolation on the contrary as if struck by lightning and is and as if possessing neither eyes nor understanding they slighted the proclamations of god at one time a star in form like a sword stood over the city and a comet which lasted for a whole year and again before the revolt and before the disturbances that led to the war when the people were gathered for the feast of unleavened bread on the eighth of the month Santhicus, at the ninth hour of the night, so great a light shone about the altar and the temple that it seemed to be, be bright day, and this continued for half an hour. This seemed to the unskilled a good sign, but, but was interpreted by the sacred scribes as portending those events which very soon took place. <clears throat> and at the same feast, a cow led by the high priest to be sacrificed brought forth a lamb in the midst of the temple. And the eastern gate of the inner temple, which was of bronze and very massive, and which at evening was closed with difficulty by twenty men and rested upon iron-bound beams and had bars sunk deep in the ground, was seen at the sixth hour of the night to open of itself. It just opened by itself, folks. That's pretty awesome. And not many days after the feast, on the 21st of the month, Artemisium, a certain marvelous vision was seen which passes belief. The prodigy might seem fabulous were it not related by those who saw it, <clears throat> and were not the calamities which follow deserving of such signs. For before the setting of the sun, chariots and armed troops were seen throughout the whole region in mid-air, wheeling through the clouds and encircling the cities. And at the feast, which is called Pentecost, when the priests entered the temple at night, as was their custom to perform the services, they said that at first they perceived a movement and a noise, and afterward a voice as of a great multitude, saying, Let us go hence. These are the events that happened prior to the siege, these signs and wonders. So there were plenty of warnings that were given, it seems like. Warnings to those that were still in unbelief to repent and turn and to flee with those that were already believing. And also warnings for those Christians now, you know, in Jerusalem that it is time to go. But what follows is still more terrible for a certain for a certain uh Jesus, the son of Ananias, a common countryman, this is another guy named Jesus, it wasn't the Jesus of the Bible. A common countryman, four years before the war, when the city was, was particularly prosperous and peaceful, came to the feast at which it was customary for all to make tents at the temple to the honor of God, and suddenly began to cry out, A voice from the east, a voice from the west, a voice from the four winds, a voice against Jerusalem and the temple, a voice against bridegrooms and brides, a voice against all the people. Day and night he went through all the alleys crying this. Day and night, but certain of the more distinguished citizens, vexed at the at the ominous cry, seized the man and beat him with many stripes, but without uttering a word on his own behalf or saying anything in particular to those that were present, he continued to cry out in the same words as before. And the rulers, thinking as was true that the man was moved by a higher power brought him before the Roman governor, and then, though he was scourged to the bone, he neither made supplication nor shed tears. <coughs> but, changing his voice to the most lamentable tone possible, he answered each stroke, he answered each stroke with the words, Woe, woe unto Jerusalem. Again, this guy kept on crying out in the streets a voice from the east a voice from the west a voice from the four winds a voice against Jerusalem and the temple a voice against bridegrooms and brides a voice against all the people day and night he went through all the alleys crying thus 
the same historian records another fact still more wonderful than this he says that a certain oracle was found in their sacred writings which declared that at that time a certain person should go forth from their country to rule the world he himself understood that this was fulfilled in Vespasian but Vespasian did not rule the whole world but only that part of it which was subject to the Romans with better right could be applied to Christ to whom it was said by the father ask me and I will give you the heathen for your inheritance and the end of the earth for your possession at that very time indeed the voice of his holy apostles went throughout all the earth and the words to the end of the world <coughs> folks the events of 70 AD is very paramount and it tells a story it tells a story that when Jesus said your house is left unto you desolate and for those Christians that can understand that Jesus is God Jesus is the everlasting father the Prince of Peace when they can understand this fact and when they said when he when he said to the Pharisees and the scribes in the temple that saying your house is left unto you desolate that regardless of what happened in 1948 regardless of what happened in 1967 the whole six-day war anything that's going on now regardless of that fact that house over there is left unto them desolate God is not there and when they're praying at the Wailing Wall they are not praying to the true God because if you do not have the son you do not have the father in the next video um, I'm going to uh, play an audio clip regarding the Wailing Wall. I think it's called False Accusations of the Wailing Wall or something like that. Um, I'm not going to say a word in it. I'm just going to let the audio clip play. And, uh, and we'll continue that, you know, we'll continue from there. Um, it's only going to get more interesting. Because uh, we're going to be jumping into very soon into modern times. Modern, as in, you know, the 19th century, 19th, 20th, and 21st century, maybe parts of the 18th century regarding Napoleon and these types of things. And uh, thus would conclude this series. Truth be told, truth be known, stay safe, God bless, see you next time, bye-bye.